Hi everyone, I'm Carmen and I'm part of the Nano Engineered Systems Lab of UCL with Professor Manish Tawari as my supervisor. Today I'm going to be talking about my work on nanocomposites enabling smart healthcare devices through infection control, sensing and energy harvesting capabilities. As a clinical case study, I'm going to also be talking about our, our work in collaboration with the obstetricians from UCLH in order to develop our novel sensorized surgical glove to improve the safety and training in operative birth. So throughout the years, high density tactile sensor arrays have proved very useful for a wide range of applications. Here I cite two examples in which they use such sensors powered by batteries. These studies show that using these sensors together with machine learning, they're able to detect different kinds of objects. So we have found great inspiration in works like these on high density tactile sensor arrays in order to develop our own novel sensorized surgical glove for healthcare applications following the need for interventional surgery and healthcare devices. And out of all of the numerous requirements needed for healthcare applications, we have been focusing on these three main ones, which are sensing capabilities, energy harvesting, and infection prevention. So in order to achieve this, the strategy we have followed is to make use of triboelectricity. Triboelectricity is a type of contact electrification which takes place when two dissimilar materials come into contact, are separated or are rubbed against each other. This contact electrification, together with electrostatic induction, is what enables triboelectric sensors to produce a current whenever they come into contact, separated or rubbed against a material. And the thing is, triboelectric sensors not only have the potential of detecting, but also of being self-powered due to their energy harvesting capabilities. And now the question which arises is, what if we could endow these triboelectric materials with further properties needed for healthcare applications? Well, this can actually be done through the use of rationally selected nanocomposites. Through advanced interfacial engineering, we're able to design materials with customized properties, some of these being adhesion or infection control. Through adhesion control, we are able to make the material super hydrophobic and thus self-cleaning, so we can avoid moisture and fouling. And through infection control, we can make them biocidal, so they will be antibacterial essentially, which are two um, very important requirements for healthcare applications. So all in all, we are contributing in a simple, rapid, novel approach to prototype healthcare devices with these three properties that I have mentioned in the previous slide and throughout the presentation. The way we have gone on about this is to make use of two set of capabilities that we have in the lab, which allows us to address this in quite a unique manner. So one of them is our 3D printing in a micro scale, and the other is nanocomposite coating spraying. Both of these brought together can be used to enhance the functionality of tactile sensors. So the first thing I want to show is our high resolution 3D printer in action. This shows the ability we have of miniaturization. I use this to print the flexible electrodes of the sensor. Then I simply um, spray coat the novel triboelectric nanocomposite onto these uh, printed flexible electrodes as a post-treatment strategy, and this already gives it the triboelectric, super hydrophobic, and antibacterial properties all at once. And with this, we're able to develop our first prototype of a triboelectric sensor, which has the uh, potential of detecting, but also of being self-powered because of these energy harvesting capabilities. So now I want to talk a, a bit about our clinical application and why the rationale behind why we developed this sensorized surgical glove. So to give a bit of clinical background, um, up to a third of women can have an operative vaginal birth, so it's really common. And we know that vaginal examination during delivery is highly subjective and that instrument placing is suboptimal in up to 30% of cases, which can lead to neonatal trauma or prolonged hospital stays. Furthermore, uh, second rate cesarean sections are increasing with also increased uh, failed instrumental deliveries and decreased attempts. It is thought that because of uh, less training that there is now, the trainees have less clinical exposure and as a result, they feel less confident uh, performing operative vaginal birth. So with this in mind, we have developed our sensorized surgical glove, working in collaboration with the obstetricians from UCLH. The way we have gone on about this is by simply 
printing the electrodes directly onto the glove material and simply spray coating the novel nano composite I was mentioning before onto the fingertips. And with this sensorized glove, what we aim to do is to give an objective, uh, objective information regarding both the orientation of the baby's head during delivery and also the forces exerted in real time uh, during the vaginal examination and birth. So in order to uh, validate the sensorized gloves, we have created an experimental setup in the lab with the help of Shireen, one of the obstetricians. For this purpose, we have been collaborating with Dr. Eleanor Mako from Professor Dejardin's team in order to develop our own models of the neonatal head. So as you can see over here in our models, we are able to replicate the fontanelles and the sutures. The sutures is what you can see in yellow over here, which is where the skull bones meet. And what we have seen is that because of the triboelectric nature of the sensor, it's able to produce distinguishable and repeatable peaks whenever it encounters one of these sutures, as you can see in the graphs over here. And as a result, by simply counting the peaks, we know whether we are encountering either the anterior fontanelle, which has four sutures and thus four peaks, or the posterior fontanelle, which you can see the triangle over there, which um, is made up of three sutures, and thus we can see three peaks. So now I wanted to show you a proof of concept of how this may all work. Um, oh, sorry. Let me see if I can play the video. There. So this is actually Shireen uh, wearing the sensorized surgical glove with another layer of surgical glove on top for sterility purposes. She is performing a mock vaginal examination of one of the phantoms that we have in the lab. And as you can see in the software interface we've uh, developed using LabVIEW, there is a red diamond that's going to appear on the screen um, over there on the top right. This is just uh, for visual purposes. They wanted to show um, a red diamond whenever they encounter the anterior fontanelle or as you will see next, a green triangle whenever encountering the posterior one. So now you're going to see um, a close-up of the screen of what is actually happening and it's pretty much what I was showing in the slide before in the graphs. So every time she's crossing a suture, we get to see these distinguishable peaks and the software for now simply counts them and it is able to show that the sensorigus glove can successfully detect both the anterior fontanelle and now the posterior fontanelle, as you will see in a second. In this case, there's three sutures and it's going to show a green triangle, which you can see on the top right. So this uh, software interface also allows us to set a, a threshold, a force threshold, and if the clinician exceeds this force threshold, they will get alerted. So now um, I'm going to pass. This is the same thing. So basically three peaks encountered for the posterior fontanelle and the glove successfully identifying it. So the way we've gone on about the force calibration, in order to be able to set these thresholds in our software and to alert the clinician, is by also developing a setup in the lab. This setup comprises a force gauge, a positional motor, and a duck cart that works simultaneously, again, by means of a virtual interface developed using LabVIEW. So through this setup, we are able to obtain calibration curves, such as the one you can see on the right, to which we can fit equations and then directly translate current readings into force values. Um, next, I wanted to talk a bit more about the different properties of this coating and thus of the sensors. So as you can see on the left over there, that's an SEM image of the triboelectric coating. You can clearly distinguish the zinc oxide nanoparticles. These give the coating a rough morphology and as a result make it super hydrophobic. Furthermore, zinc oxide is a well-known biocidal agent which renders it antibacterial. We have carried out extensive antibacterial tests. Here you can see an example of the Kirby-Bauer variant test. We've used it with E. coli, gram-negative bacteria, Esaurios, a gram-positive, and also strep B, which is highly relevant in, the, in this clinical application. And we can see that the area in which the sensor was placed, we can't observe any bacterial growth whatsoever after 24-hour incubation. We have also carried out extensive um, cytotoxicity tests in which we have been able to see that using human dermal fibroblasts, uh, the sensor shows very high biocompatibility. If you compare the control, which is A, to D, which is treated after 72 hours, there's above 90% viability, which is really good. Uh, finally, really quick, in terms of the energy harvesting capabilities, 
Analogous to previous demonstrations showing the power density issues regarding single layer triboelectric nanogenerators, which is the geometry I've been showing along this presentation, we've studied its enhancement using different kind of spacer layers. Here with a simple air spacer that was 3D printed, we are able to obtain uh, voltages of open circuit vo of 150 volts and to light up up to 60 LEDs, which you can see in the video over here. Yeah. Okay. So I'm running out of time. So all in all, uh, just to finish, we have contributed in introducing a novel, simple and rapid approach to prototype devices for healthcare applications with antibacterial, super hydrophobic, non-cytotoxic and sensing and energy harvesting capabilities. We have also shown accurate detection of sutures in models of the neonatal head that we have developed in the lab. And um, finally, as I showed, we have carried out extensive antibacterial and also cytotoxicity testing to make sure that they are antibacterial and also that they will be safe to use. So in terms of the future directions, we are now carrying out a feasibility study in the lab in which obstetricians of varying grades are coming to test the device. And hopefully in the future, we will be able to test this in a first in human study. Uh, we are also carrying out extensive force calibration and stiffness calibration tests with the setup I showed using materials of known elastic moduli to hopefully in the future also be able to give some kind of indication and quantification of stiffness values, not just change in stiffness, which is what we're seeing now. And yeah, finally, hopefully as well, create a fully self-powered tactile system because there is potential for this with these kinds of sensors. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, so actually these um, sensors are one-time use, all of them, for sterility purposes. So we don't really look into that as of now especially because what we're detecting now is the change in stiffness. We're not quantifying that. That's, uh, that's going to take a lot of time. We're doing a lot of extensive testing right now. But um, yeah, that's definitely something that hopefully with machine learning, some people in the team are trying to get into to see if it can be overcome. Yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. Have we got any questions from the audience? Yep, um, we've got a microphone just working its way around to you right now, so just bear with us a second. Hi, thank you for the Hi. presentation. I do thank have you. two questions. The first one is, uh, uh, what happens if someone misses the fourth corner? For example, this is the diamond suture, it does the wrong pattern and it actually discovers on mm. the tree. Yes. And the second question is, does the material, of, uh, the nanomaterial, does it harm the baby? Mm. Thank you. Thank you. So for the first question, I think one of the main focuses that we've always had is to um, maintain the sensors as thin as possible. These are super thin, just so that we don't alter the perception of the clinician. So this was always done in mind um, to be used as a helping tool. So the clinician still will be able to feel exactly what they usually feel. So when they wear the sensorized glove, they don't even feel that there's a sensor there. It just feels like a normal glove to them, pretty much. So what we do is this will give extra information, if that makes sense. So there has to be a protocol to it, because obviously, as you say, if they just kind of go everywhere, it's going to detect sutures, but they're not going to know exactly. So the way we do, for example, now in our feasibility study, is we first tell the clinician to have a feel around the different models. Some of them have swelling and other things to make it a bit harder, which is what happens in real life. Um, after they have a feel around and they know they are in one of the fontanelles, which is what they usually do in routine, then we tell them, okay, now rub around it, analogous to the way you would during normal procedure. And then there is where they can double check that they were correct or wrong in thinking it was the anterior or the posterior. And once they check this, they're able to orientate themselves. So, yeah, if that makes sense. And um, then in terms of the materials, so that's why we've done the cytotoxicity tests using human cells. And these have shown a really good biocompatibility. I mean, all the materials we use, they actually follow EU regulations for what is used in, I don't know, dental implants and toothpaste, etc. 
they have all been thoroughly studied and they are all they all pass all the cytotoxicity tests essentially and we checked even though in the lab and it's okay i hope <laughs> thank you very much again thank you <laughs>
get the um, using uh, segmentation um, uh, procedures or techniques to get the, to extract all the data from the patients. You input the data the, uh, to the uh, uh, to, to our platform, and it will create a simulation for different parts of uh, the patients. Like for the soft tissue, it can uh, uh, produce the soft uh, the deformation uh, modeling. Uh, for the heart, uh, for the heart objects like the bones, it can provide the haptic feedback for that as well. And uh, we also have the uh, haptic rendering layers, which provide different type of haptic effects. It depends on the objects you are inputting. Um, and also, we uh, we have the visual visual mode of uh, our platform that visualize everything to you via the uh, the goggles, the VR headset or the augmented reality headset. Um, it's one assemble of our um, uh, platform. It's the actually quite a uh, uh, previous version of our platform, of our robot. Uh, we call it this one is Simultouch. So basically, as you can see here, on the left-hand side, um, the, our setup, the bi-manual setup with two robots. Um, and um, th that setup is for laparoscopy tools. As you can see here, it's a player Caesar. Um, the, the, the surgeons can, can wrap this one and have the haptic feedback when, they, uh, when they're touching the, the objects. And um, just a quick video showing how, how, how it works. Um, so this basically a uh, project from our uh, okay, uh, student. My, my model, um, my VR model of a percutaneous intervention delivery. So first I, I have needle and I had a target in the, in the liver, which is a, a, a tumor, which I, I can make a chemical ablation of the tumor. And so basic, basically a, a cancer a treatment for liver. Um, in the in screen, I guess it, this is my view. You can also see who is working, uh, the liver, in the spine, the pelvis, in the screen you can see the matrix at the distance of the needle uh, for the tumor and also uh, a fluoroscopy, the x-ray showing me if you, if you can see the screen. So on the left hand side you can see there's a live um, image of the x-ray which is basically not happening in the real world but we can do that with the, with the simulation. We can uh, update the, the, the image in real time. And the right hand side, basically the distance between the, the tool and the target. And uh, again, that's something that's not available in the real world. But with the simulation, we can provide that and also enhance the, um, the, the training for, for, the, for the surgeons or the, or, or, or the trainees. Um, so that was a very good platform, a very good robot. But we had a lot of problems with it when we want to when we, we want to travel with it uh, because it's very bulky. As you can see, we we kept it broken all the time. Um, so well, we, we need to find out a better way to do it. Uh, then we come up with, with this one. Uh, happily, uh, basically, uh, it's a free commercial device. We are um, co collaborating with a, company, a Canadian company. Um, this one can provide. Um, Six degree of freedom movement and three degree of freedom uh, happy feedback. Um, so this is basically how um, the left hand side uh, of the image basically show how uh, currently uh, surgeons practice with their with their procedures. They practice on uh, the 3D printed objects um, and with a lot of screens, a lot of setup. Uh, uh, a laser mes me me measurement um, devices, um, but we can transfer that everything they are practicing uh, right now in the real world to the virtual domain uh, easily. Um, so what makes our platform uh, different uh, from the other approach? Because we can make things very easy for the for the users. So basically, we don't require any technical uh, knowledge of the user, anyone without uh, programming uh, knowledge, without um, technical background can, can create their, their own simulation using our approach. We create a customized UI 
over the top of Unreal Engine and make things very, very simple to the user. Um, as you can see, just press the button, choose the procedure you want to create, choose the move you want to create, set up and you have a folder of the patient. Um, and then you can load the uh, surgical scene already there for you. Now you can upload the patient data to that folder. Just drag and drop on the patient's data objects, 3D objects you got from the uh, segmentation. Drag and drop there, import on. And they're ready for you. Now you can, again, just drag and drop on the objects to uh, 3D scenes. Now you have a menu here with different setup, different setting. You can apply the position, change the position, orientation of each uh, particular object, apply different haptic feedback, set up the tools, uh, set up the visuals, or choose the data you want to collect, and then basically just press apply, and everything will be there ready for you. Let me fast forward a bit. And then at the end of the session, you have the data from the patient as well. So let them, less than five minutes, anyone can do that, do that set up their own uh, simulation quite easily. A very quick video so how um, we are using AR and VR uh, for uh, arthroscopy surgical simulation. So the left hand side is the first person view uh, of, the, of the procedures. As you can see the left one here, um, is basically the, um, the camera view. And you need to clean the tissues, the, the red tissues, um, here with the tool. And you have the vi vibration feedback when, you do, when you're doing that, quite similar to, to the real procedures. And the right hand side basically will be the um, augmented reality view and virtual reality view as well. We can switch from AR to VR quite seamlessly. So this one is from the second person view. Another user can be able to, to see it. Um, so we future works will compare traditional training and simulation training. We got some um, feedback from the surgeons, and hopefully we'll validate the our tools based on that. Uh, thank you for your yeah, listening. Thank you, Hart. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience so far? Just lots of thinking. Um, I guess this is uh, very important to validate the, yeah. the feedback that you're getting. Um, and how are you going about doing Well, we are very close to ask the surgeon to come over and try our simulation. And uh, yeah, we'll go forward from there. Okay. Um, any other questions? Yes, one over here. Uh, the microphone is just on its way. Hi, thank you, Ha. Uh, good, uh, nice presentation. Just one question. So, in one of your slides, you said that uh, in the simulation, you have a uh, online or, or real-time x-ray, for example. Yeah. But in the real theater, there's no. Yeah. So my question is, if someone is trained on this online x-ray and then he goes to the real surgical theater and there's no online, would that actually be bad for you? Yeah, very, very good, good, good question. Basically, we, we provide a tool for the user. So they can make it easier or they can make it similar to real life. It, it's up to them. But we provide different options for them to choose. I see. All right. Thank you very much. I think in the interest of time, we're going to uh, move on to the next speaker. So thank you again, Hart. Thank you. Thanks. Maybe we'll start with this. Yeah, thank you. 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 Yeah, that one. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, 
thanks very much and, uh, for the introduction, and thanks for uh, being invited here to talk. Um, you know, when, the, when this uh, was announced, I was wondering which, which bit of, uh, of robotics I should talk about to everyone. And this is something, whereas we've seen some quite f finished and polished applications, this is just sort of some, some basic technology that I'm, um, uh, I'm interested in. There are a few slides of surgery, so if you're squeamish, uh, you may want to, uh, want to look away. Um, I thought I'd start just by describing, so the, uh, the Da Vinci uh, surgical system is a collaborative robot, you know, I'll use the uh, pointer instead. Um, which one is it? Is it there? No. No, I don't think it points, but you can use it. Oh, I see. Yeah, All right, I'll, I'll carry on with the mouse. Um, so the point is that the, the robot itself is... Um, uh, uh, controlled by a human, so like you, you have manipulation going on, and the human has a uh, certain vision. Um, and so here, these are actually synchronised. So the, so the motions of the hand is what's performing the surgery. And what you see is that you know, with experience, the surgeons are actually very good at, feed, at, at knowing how hard to pull the tissue, how hard to push the tissue, and so on. Thanks very much. There we go. Yeah. Um, and uh, but the, you know the robot itself, when it's the way it's controlled, there is no force feedback. There's no haptics, nothing like that. And this was kind of been uh, recognised as potentially uh, a bit of an issue in terms of, particularly in terms of training. Um, what you find is that the ex the experienced surgeons just know from looking at the tissue and how much it's moving, or when they're tying stitches and so on they know how, to, um, how hard to press. And they, f they almost feel like they have visual, they, they, they actually have um, uh, haptic feedback, but it's all coming from the eyes. So there is a demand for haptic feedback, is that you know, the lack of it is, you know, it, it traditionally is kind of seen as a, as a, as a drawback, a, 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 a problem with robotic surgery. When people are training, it's quite a common thing that they pull the stitches too hard and break them because you can't feel how hard you're, you're pulling. And they need to learn to do that. Um, so if we could communicate these forces, we might be able to at least accelerate the learning curve. And the learning curve for robotics is a, is a known big problem. You need 200 cases under your belt before you're considered com you know, competent expert. You know, maybe even 1,000 are needed. And perhaps we can make this a bit quicker. So what I was looking at is trying to get some kind of visual feedback of the force. Uh, and I'm trying to estimate, we're trying to sort of emulate this human thing of using your vision uh, in order to uh, work out what the force is. Now, <clears throat> there are ways of estimating forces in surgical robotics. There's been quite a few of these proposed. Uh, you can use the, like, the, the currents in the, in, the, in the motors that are driving the robot to give you an estimate. That's not really very good at getting the, um, anything more than the grip force, to be, to be honest, because by the time you've gone back through a number of joints, the inaccuracies mount together and you don't get a particularly good estimate that way. You can have force measurement devices, and we've seen quite a few of these, Carmen's talk, for example, or, you know, the, 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 but you know, they would require amending the existing robot, and the existing robot is very popular, you know, it's been used, it's the one surgical robot that has seen enormous uh, clinical use. Um, <clears throat> so another way to do it is you can observe tissue deformation and have some kind of physical model of the tissue and people have achieved that to some degree. It works for sort of homogeneous tissue like liver or possibly brain. But, you know, if you've got different tissues around, you know, this is, that, getting that simulation right is quite hard. Um, and so what I looked at, actually just a little while ago, is trying to estimate this force simply by looking at the visual position of the tool um, and the kinematic predicted position of the tool and comparing the two. So you do forward kinematics um, and that tells you where the, where the tool should be. You have to do a hand-eye calibration to match that up to the, to the visual field. Uh, and then, you know, in principle, that's all you need. You can just display. We'll have a look at some, uh, some videos of it. It's not, you know, well, I th hopefully you'll see that the effect does exist. Um, 
And so if you, if you, you, you're, you can, in principle, you should be following the kinematic position beautifully. And then when those, those positions diverge, um, you end up with getting an estimate of force. Um, so we did some, uh, some estimates in the lab. This is the setup, and this is just one example. We have a hugely expensive force measurement device here that you may, you may have come across in the past. We get all the most expensive equipment when it comes to it. Um, we were thinking of having a go at this with a proper six degree of freedom. This was just an initial experiment. And what you see is that the, um, the kinematic, the, here we've got the visual position um, and then and the kinematic position, and they diverge as the force increases. Um, and um, this is a standard data set called jigsaws that's used for, used for training. Um, and again here, so as, you, as you're tightening the stitches, um, you end up with a, a divergence. Now, again, I'm not using a particularly clever optical tracker here, um, but you know, it's enough to be able to see that as you, as you, as you apply the force, you get a measurement of, uh, uh, well, you get, it's not a measurement, you get a sort of indication of the force. You know, I can't say it's exactly matched. Uh, um, and the advantage of this is that we do that we get that without any adding any force measurement device. You're just looking at the difference between the visual and kinematic. Now this is a bit, again, if you just look at where those dots move, you know, as the, as the stitch is tightened, you see them move apart. Well, I haven't lined these up particularly well. You know, this is not a perfect hand-eye calibration by any means. Um, now with the later robot and the particular case of uh, laparoscopic partial nephrectomy. This is like where, this is where they're uh, removing a tumour from the kidney. Um, hopefully, again, uh, you can see that like um, the tracking is much better. One thing I was going to say. So the tracking is much better uh, using uh, the newer robots. The older, I mean, sorry, I'm, I'm digressing slightly, but the older robots used to have an absolute accuracy. It could be, you know, even down to a centimetre out or two centimetres out, but it doesn't matter because you've got a human controlling it and they will move it until it's in the right place. So having the human uh, made it a bit different, but they've improved the, uh, significantly the kinematics and, uh, and it's much more accurate now. And hopefully that much more accurate point, so if you look at this dot, as it tightens, it moves away a little bit as well, you know, a bit, a bit like the previous one. So there you can see it move away as they tighten the stitch. Um, all I'm showing on the left here is that, you know, we've made really just an initial attempt at trying to do visual tracking of the tools. The, the tracking of the tool, the visual tracking of tools is quite a hot topic in, uh, in surgical robotics at the moment. Um, I'll mention those in a bit. Now, it's not perfect, you know, it gets, it gets a bit lost when everything gets covered up. Um, but uh, when it can see it, 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 at least some parts of the, of the tool, I mean, it's massively covered up now. Let's go a bit later. Let's go a bit earlier, actually. Uh, you can see that these first two points are quite well, quite well tracked. But this is something we want to make better. So to summarise, these experienced surgeons, they can overcome the lack of haptics with their visual cues. However, you know, with um, uh, uh, you know, learning is, is a significant issue um, and perhaps visual cues could help trainees, that's our thought. Um, you can look at the tissue deformation or suture shape, you can look at how taught the um, the suture looks um, and uh, uh, and so on. Um, but what we've actually shown is that this sort of visual cues. You know, we could we we could shorten the learning curve for sure, um, and really that force uh, might be a useful input to the system. Uh, uh, to uh, we, we if it gives us an extra piece of information. So we we do quite a bit of work looking at the tool motion and trying to judge surgical skill um, and so trying to identify motion associated with expert motion um, or to you know, identify exactly gestures or area or po points in the procedure and adding this kind of force indication might, uh, might improve those, uh, those kind of uh, measures that, 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 that try to uh, predict good surgery. If we, if we, can, if we can actually characterise somehow Good, what, what makes good surgical practice, then we can hopefully help trainees to get there uh, quicker. 
so obviously this is this is quite in a way quite early work. I mean, we want to improve the hand-eye calibration. So, and the way we do that, if you if you've got good um, visual measurement of the location of the tool. Um, I mean, the kinematics is what it is, and it's, it, it, it's pretty good now. But if you can, if you can line those up, uh, there, there, there might be things, I know certainly from the earlier robots, there was quite a lot of drift in the, in the kinematics and things like that. So if you can just continually do um, a rolling uh, calibration, then you can see where deviations were, um, indicate that there is a force applied. Uh, so, in order to make that better, uh, well, we want to do rolling uh, hand-eye calibration. We want to improve the visual tracking. This is a big area of re research. Uh, this is just one of a number of, there's the whole Endovis set of challenges um, where there's lots of challenge data sets. So, the RARP50, that was one that was done by UCL, um, by uh, the Surgical Robot Vision Group last year. Um, and that's more looking at tool segmentation, so like trying to identify it in the, in, uh, visually. Um, but if we can improve all of those, then hopefully we can, get, we can actually generate something that um, renders the... Uh, we want to render the full uh, CAD models of the tool so that it's um, overlaid on the, uh, on the video, and that will hopefully help with segmentation and everything else. So I'll just, uh, I'm not going to go through this in detail, I'll just try and finish up. Um, but it's just to say, well, okay, it's, it's a first step, you know, and there's a lot of ways that we can go. But it already uh, measures the kind of forces uh, that, are, that might be, make it a good early warning system to say you're about to break a stitch. You know, that's, that's probably as far as it is at the moment. Um, so there we are, just... Uh, um, uh, I'd just like to, you know, obviously thank all my colleagues from Surgical Robot Vision. There's multiple of those, the, and the clinicians from Royal Free, um, and uh, welcome an EPSERC for funding as well. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Eddie. Um, do we have any Thanks. questions? Okay, I've got uh, two. Um, how proactive are the companies? For example, uh, intuitive uh, robotics, because obviously it doesn't cost anything for the, for the visual side. They don't have to provide any hardware. How proactive are they? And yeah. also, one, one other one. Yeah. Um, you're using 2D images. Um, obviously, how do you, what difficulties, apart from the actual maths, would you uh, envisage going from 2D to 3D? Uh, so, uh, on the first part, well, you know, we have a research contract with Intuitive, so they're interested in us doing stuff. I think, you know, because expert surgeons don't really need a force measurement, I think there's, there's sort of like, you know, because they did also look into uh, adapting it and giving it, you know, giving it a force measurement device. And I think they feel it's not that important. But I think it, I think it potentially does have a role in training, you know, and again, so like uh, looking at what Carmen was doing or others, you know, having these kind, this kind of extra information uh, helps, um, helps with training. And the second question was, sorry. Um, the the training sets were in two D. Oh yeah, yeah. So uh, so actually, the, the uh, what I didn't show, and it, it's it's quite noticeable, is that the, the the endoscope is a stereo endoscope. So and actually, the view that the surgeon has, and it's one of the things that makes the robot effective, is very nice three D view. So you can you know it makes it makes the the whole motion much better. So the initial thing, you know, I'm, to be honest, even just as a hand-eye calibration thing, I haven't seen anyone do it, but my intention is just to use stereo reconstruction of the tool position and match that to the kinematic. You know, it's not a standard way of doing hand-eye, but there are ways of doing hand-eye, but I think it should work quite well. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, a round of applause. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's perfect. That's okay. uh, hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here to my presentation. And uh, I'm, my name is Yan Xibang, and my supervisor is Professor Helge. 
and the Professor Vivek. Uh, the topic of my presentation is uh, design and evaluation of the MR compatible robots for the cast relation. And uh, first, it's the background. Uh, nowadays, the cardiovascular disease is now an emerging leading cause for the human death. There are about 17.9 uh, million people died from the cardiovascular disease every year. So one effective to treat the, this disease is, to, is the cast relation. Uh, actually, there are two main ways to uh, the treatment of this disease. One is the X-ray. Uh, actually, the Hansen Medical have designed uh, robots that can be working the uh, can do the castration and the X-ray, and uh, it is, but they will cause the radiation to the patients. And uh, on the other hand, the, the last 20 years have seen the increasing use of the MR scanner. It can offer the images for the procedure. So for the castration, it, it needs a, a long slender or the gateway to insert into uh, people opening of the patients, and then it can uh, go to the target position of the pulmonary artery. So, um, compared with the X-ray uh, imaging, the MR scanner has some advantages. For example, there's no radiation. It has high resolution for the soft tissue. For example, the human heart and brain. And uh, there's no bone artifacts, and they can offer the multiple aspects direct images. So it is important to uh, develop some uh, robots that can work in the MR scanner. In the previous studies, there are some people are working on the MR compatible robots for the cast relation. There are two typical ones. Uh, the first one is the master slime hydraulic actuation units. It was developed by the hydraulic uh, actuation, and it is very stable, and it can Realize two degree of freedom. One is for for the caster's translation. Another one is the rotation. But the construction of these uh, robots is not very complex. And uh, the second one is the armor guided uh, interventional robots driven by the pneumatic actuation. And uh, you can see it's complex. It can also uh, realize the. A translation of the caster and the rotation, and uh, but there is a small problem that is can it's the motion is not continuous, and both these robots are for the electro um, physiological interventions, not for the pulmonary artery castration. So, so for the clinical requirements, uh, the existing AMA compatible robots are not for the pulmonary artery castration. So, and uh, the cut uh, relation requires the continuous, uh, unlimited, and the simultaneous motion of the translation and the rotation. And also, it needs that the highly complex because we need to put the robot in, into the bore of the MR scanner. Because when the patient is lying on the bore of the MR scanner, there will be very limited space for the robots to the stomach operation. So our aim is to develop uh, armor compatible castration robots which can realize the endless rotation, endless uh, translation, simultaneous translation, and rotation. And it also can be demonstrated in the armor scanner imaging in the magnetic field of 1.7 Tesla. And the effects, uh, in addition to the actuation of hydraulic or pneumatic there's also a uh, very important actuation is called uh, ultrasonic motor. Ultrasonic motor is MR compatible. It's highly complex, and uh, uh, this, this picture and video show how it works. It's uh, has, with high speed, high precision, high stability, and more importantly, it is MR compatible. How the ultrasonic motor works uh, it's different with the common motor, such as the stepper or the server motor, uh, because, uh, uh, for example, the stepper there ha there has a magnetic uh, fields and the uh, rotor with the coins. But for the ultrasonic motor, uh, we just use the 
auto sending waves to generate a with high, uh, very high frequency is about 2,000 hertz, and uh, which you, human cannot hear, and uh, it's uh, there is no magnets and uh, magnetic fields of the auto sending motor, so it is AMA compatible. <coughs> Based on this actuation, uh, we designed the, and fabricated our two degree of freedom robots, and uh, they are also exploring a view of these uh, robots, which including the uh, motors, the bearings, the gears, and the 3D printed structure, and also the slippering, all the components as are more comp compatible. For, for the clinical requirements, we need to realize the translation and the rotation. And the first one, translation, we use the, we designed very easy structure to, of, it's called Mast slave rollers. The mast slave rollers is driven by the auto tending motor, and it can. Uh, and on the surface of the rollers, there is also very soft uh, <coughs> layers to protect and increase the friction of the to uh, actuate the caster to move for forwards or backwards. And then it can realize the translation. For the second, is the rotational parts. We in order to, re in order to uh, realize the simultaneous motion of these uh, movements, we designed, uh, we used the, a hair tall, uh, a bigger ultrasonic motor to realize the, the whole rotation of the translational parts. And then it's, this uh, robots can uh, realize the endless rotation, translation, and the simultaneous movements. After finishing the design and fabrication of the robots, as shown in the, in the video show, uh, the, the, our design um, robots, you can see it can realize the translation of the caster and the rotation and the simultaneous, uh, simultaneous work in one time. And uh, in order to evaluate the, our robots that can work in the AMA scanner, we designed and built the whole uh, control system, robotic system, uh, which includes the USB camera, the pulmonary artery, phantom environment, and uh, the control boards and the joysticks. We just need to use the joystick to control uh, <coughs> the robots to realize the movements. Uh, when we put the control boards and the joysticks uh, in the main control room of the mass, uh, of our mass scanner, and uh, put the phantom and the robots into the into the bowl of the mass scanner. We designed uh, three experiments to eva evaluate the performance. Uh, one is the real-time precision tracking. It can get the uh, operator to do how, it's, how to do the translation, how to do the rotation. And the second experiment is uh, to measure the contact force because we need to make sure it can offer uh, enough friction force to uh, actuate the caster and the very safe contact force. So we designed the uh, experiment setup to uh, measure the force, the toll, and the friction. For the sec uh, third experiment, we evaluate the IMR compatibility. And we post the, our phantom with filled water and uh, the robots into the bowl of the IMR standard. And you can see our robots is very Compact with just uh, uh, 130 millimeters in length, and uh, and uh, after we post the AMA scanner in four states. Uh, the first one is uh, just the post the phantom, and uh, the second one we post the robots and the phantom into the bowl of AMA scanner, and the third one is post the robots with power but mo no motion, and the fourth one we operate the the robots to uh, do intervention into the phantom to do the comparison with the four states and uh, then we can get the four states of images from AMA scanner and to evaluate uh, the uh, SNR signal to ratio SNR is a criteria to uh, measure the AMA compatibility and uh, <coughs> And we can calculate the SNR value to uh, in four states. 
And for the experiment two, you can see that we uh, realized the real-time precision tracking in uh, 2D, and uh, it can offer the X, Y coordinates of the in the phantom of the castle tape position. After the experiments, and uh, there's a table to show our robots for the actuation. We use the ultra sending motor, it's armor compatible. And uh, for the dimensions, you can see that it's much more compact than the previous designs. And uh, more importantly, it can uh, realize the simultaneous of translation and rotation and uh, unlimited rotation range. It is very important for the clinical requirements for the pulmonary artery castration. And uh, also, uh, there's just the one point nine percent loss in SNR. So it, you can see that it is our robots is MR compatible. For the contact force and the tool, and it also can be uh, meet our requirements. Conclusion and uh, <clears throat> this is our research projects we designed a very highly complex armor uh, compatible robotic system which can realize the simultaneous continuous unlimited rotation and translation of the caster. And we also did the uh, demonstrated the armor compatibility and the 2D real-time caster tape frozen tracking is uh, was achieved. And in the future work, an armor guided caster relation operation will be carried out with real-time imaging of the armor scanner and with yeah, and uh, also, we are doing the reinforcement machine learning work to uh, achieve the autonomous uh, work of the robots. This is our compatible, I'm a compatible research team. Uh, my thanks to my supervisor, uh, Professor Helge and the Professor Vivek for their uh, strong support. And uh, thanks to my collaborator, it's Mr. Inhui. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ash, for that uh, really challenging work, I think, that you're yeah. doing there. Um, do we have any, oh, we're very eager with questions in the audience today, so maybe we can get a mic in some back there, please. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Thank you very much for your very nice presentation. Um, I actually want to, my question is exactly uh, in line with what you just mentioned. You uh, presented it in a very smooth way. Uh, but I believe that ha you have been experiencing a lot of challenges yeah. to get to where you are yeah. and also moving forward uh, towards your future uh, work um, goals. So I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the challenges that you have experienced and how you overcome, overcame them. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. And uh, the biggest challenge is about, I think, the uh, to realize the tracking of the cast tape. And uh, as you know, we use the camera and uh, with the uh, metal light motion toolbox because, but for the 3D tracking of the cast tape, it's very difficult. Uh, but now we are, tr uh, we are trying to uh, overcome this problem. We are using the, uh, <coughs> the another sensor with a 60 degree of freedom to, it can get to the uh, 3D position of the cast tape in the, in the phantom. Yeah, uh, we are doing it now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and good luck with the continuation of this really important work. Thank you, Ash. Thank One you. more uh, round of applause. Okay. Um, 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Jin Ke Yao, and I'm from Soft Robotics and Haptics Lab. And my supervisor is also Professor Hak Ugna and Professor Gaetano Bruski. So today I want to introduce uh, Mevoloplasticity Balloon Catheter Assisted Compliant Aortic Annulus Sizing with Variable Elliptic Ratio. So what is? Uh, Valvuloplasty balloon catheter. So it is the um, uh, interventional device used for the cardiovascular interventions for the uh, aortic stenosis treatment. It is a uh, narrow of the aortic valve opening, as you can see here. Um, and the disease one. So it cannot open fully to get your enlarged cardiac output. So one of the interventional treatment is transcatheter aortic valve implantation. So here, a balloon is uh, delivered and uh, expand the stent valve, and it can replace the di diseased heart valve and open fully for the cardiac output. So another treatment is balloon aortic valvuloplasticity. So it is a simple low-cost intervention treatment, and it can be a bridge treatment to the TAVI for the pre deletion of the um, diseased valve. So when we choose the prosthetic of the heart valve, we need to make sure the size of the valve is suitable for the patient. So um, previous, uh, nowadays, we use pre-operative sizing assessment to measuring the arctic annulus dimension according to the imaging-based technology such as echocardiography or the CT. However, it has some drawbacks such as the uh, sub, uh, subjective error which is made by the clinician because it uses the computer to choose the point for the dimension of the annulus. And another one is the geometry of the annulus might change after the um, bulb. So these drawbacks may lead to the complications like aortic regurgitation or uh, atrioventricular blocks. So um, what we can do for others is maybe we can use the intraoperative by the device of the balloon catheter. So here is the aim of our project is an intraoperative method for determining the arctic annulus diameter based on its compliance and elliptical uh, geometry properties from a robotized arctic valvuloplasty balloon catheter. So the question is, can we just use the uh, commercial balloon catheter? Yes, of course. We just need to design an inflation device to connect with any commercial balloon catheter. And then we can control the speed of the inflation and also the volume inside the balloon. So here is the um, software for the driver for uh, input what value and what speed you want to in, uh, inflate the balloon and the signal um, among the system. So we need to validate whether the method is useful. So first, we create some idealized annular phantoms by 3D printing with two different diameters and four different shore hardenings from 16A to 95A. So um, this can contain the health uh, annulus and the diseased calcified uh, annulus and three different um, uh, optical ratios uh, of the ge geometry of the annulus and one circular one. So here is our uh, experimental protocol, which we input or insert the balloon inside the phantom and inflate it until it reaches the uh, maximum pressure of it. And then with a, a constant flow rate about one meter per second. And here you can see the free inflation of the balloon. Uh, for the uh, tension part, because the balloon membrane will be tensioned after a, um, after like 14 uh, volume imp input. So here is the result for the um, balloon inflation, the PV curves data for different um, geometries uh, or the elliptical ratios 
or the different uh, stiffness of the phantoms. As you can see, for the different uh, ellipticals, it, uh, the pressure will increase at the different point of volume. And with the increase of the um, stiffness, the slope of the PV curve also increased. Oops, sorry. So here is the video shows how, how the balloon is inflated and the PV uh, data record in real time. So because the membrane is not tensioned, so it will continue until it's tensioned and expand the phantom. And here is the balloon inflate the elliptical one. So now we know that the um, PV data is changed according to it touching the phantom. So we create uh, analytical models and numerical models for the balloon for its free inflection and to get the interaction point when it's fully touching the phantom. And according to this, we have the diameter as a function of the pressure, then we can estimate the phantom's diameter. So here is the uh, mathematical one according to the strength, strength uh, analyze. And here is the numerical models for uh, a real one. So because previous one, we use the end of the balloon as a hemi, uh, hemi, semi hemisphere, but this one we have the real one. And according to the simulation, we can get the uh, relationship between dimension, pressure, and volume. So here is the algorithm to uh, estimate the di dimension. And according to different inflation lines, we can get the interaction and the two lines and the point is the pressure when it's fully contact. According to the pressure, we can calculate the dimension. And for the elliptic one, we can get when the pressure is changed a lot, the point of the volume is the short diameter of the elliptic phantom. So here is the result for 21 millimeter and 20, uh, sorry, 22 and 21 millimeters. So here is all results for the all phantoms. And you can see it's quite good for the um, circle and uh, when the elliptic ratio is about 0.8. And uh, here is arrows for them. So for the uh, circle one and the uh, elliptical at 0 0.8, it have the arrow less than 0 point, uh, less than 5%. And for the rigid of the elliptic phantoms, it shows uh, accept, uh, acceptable arrows for um, more rigid one. So here is the conclusion. In this work, uh, the possibility of the sizing, the Arctic analysts from intra-balloon pressure and volume data acquired from a balloon catheter was investigated. So the inflation device can capture the internal pressure and volume of the balloon. And uh, it can also um, connect to any commercially balloon catheters. And also the performance of the algorithm shows a good perception of the circle and 0 0.8 elliptical ratio phantoms. And for the short diameter elliptation, and the rigid one is acceptable, uh, with acceptable, uh, acceptable arrows, which is uh, 85A and 95A, which can be, can for the uh, uh, calcified one. So here is the future, we can have more realistic phantom and considering the positive fluid environment in Rio. So that's all, that's my presentation. Thanks for your listening. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions? Thank you very much for your nice presentation. Um, 
I was wondering what sort of challenges you expect uh, using the pulse duplicating machine. Oh, so for this one is the challenge one is whether I can use the um, because it also has the pressure to influence balloon. Can I just remove the influence of the pulse duplicator? And also whether I can use the that um, that's pressure to do the balloon to uh, have the in, improve the sizing algorithm. Any more questions? Okay, I've got one. Um, so your previous work has used fairly standard phantoms. Yeah. What issues do you foresee for using uh, patient-specific phantoms? Mm, what I'm planning to do is maybe use silicon one with some uh, calcified attach on it that will be more uh, realistic. And also include the leaflet, move, movable leaflets for the sizing to see whether the leaflets will influence a lot to the algorithm. Excellent. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Okay, uh, a round of applause uh, for all of our speakers. Uh, that concludes uh, today's session uh, for this morning's. Uh, massive thank you to all of our speakers, uh, massive thank you to the organisers, to Matty, and uh, we restart at 2 o'clock. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the day.